to introduce our featured presenter tonight, Dr. Edward Maloney. He uh, came to Missoula eight months ago. He's the director of St. Patrick's Addiction Treatment Program, St. Patrick's Hospital. He um, worked for years in Spokane as a family and um, addiction practitioner. I called him this afternoon and, and said, who are you again? You know, I need something to talk about. <laughs> he suggested, uh, he gave me a couple of things and then he'll probably uh, elaborate that if he desires. Um, just, I'm really um, excited about this workshop. I see just in when we went around the room earlier, there are a lot of people that have a lot of interest and passion in what's being talked about. And not only do I think you're going to get a lot out of the workshop, but I think you're going to bring a lot to it too. So without further ado, I present to you Dr. Edward, Edward Maloney. My uh, original training was in family medicine. Uh, I've been doing addiction work for the better part of 15 years <coughs> and was lucky enough uh, during one part of my career to be the medical director of a place in New Hampshire called Spocker Hall, which at that time was one of the top 10 treatment centers in the nation. And the significance of that is we did things right. And so I always think of that as the model I would like to bring treatment to. Uh, I've also had the opportunity to talk many times about adolescence and adolescent addiction. And I have a stack of these things about like that just on adolescence. And as I went through there, I wasn't sure exactly what this audience would want to hear. So there's a little bit of everything. I'm going to give you just a few statistics, not enough to drive you nuts. Uh, but it's probably important that everybody, if they're not already aware, <coughs> becomes aware uh, of the problem we have with drugs and alcohol with adolescents. And then we're going to talk a little bit about each of the drugs. Uh, and then I'm going to finish up talking a little bit about what drugs do to teenage minds and bodies and development. Now, I'm not going to go a lot into development. I have a lot on development, but I see that somebody's doing that further along this weekend. Uh, but just enough so that you can appreciate what happens uh, uh, and how drugs and alcohol can arrest development. Can everybody see this okay? Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Uh, In the 13 to 17 year old group, there's an estimated 3 million problem drinkers. Now, one of, the, one of the problems in this field is there's no clear definition of abuse or addiction. And so sometimes we use these rather broad terms like problem drinkers, which usually uh, refers to people who both abuse and are addicted to a chemical. Um, the startling thing is that there's over 300,000 teenagers who are alcohol dependent. Now the difference between abuse in the DSM-3-R and the dsm 4 which is a diagnostic and statistical manual that's used by psychiatrists, is essentially the compulsion to use something. At some point in a person's history with chemicals, they go from, and I have, a, I have an overhead on this, but they go from casual use to abusing. Now, abusing is defined by getting in trouble with a drug and not letting go of it. And addiction is defined as the compulsion to use the drug. There's a preoccupation with the drug. Uh, one of the things, that, one of the examples is a person who, for instance, is alcoholic, whether they be uh, an adolescent or an adult, uh, who on Wednesday is already thinking about how they're going to get drunk on Friday night after work. There's a, always a preoccupation. But we're just talking about problem drinkers. The scary thing is the 300,000 that are alcohol dependent, that means they have compulsion to use the drug. Very often are with, with Conjure would be fine as type 2 alcoholics who have a lot of violent crime associated with their drinking, uh, etc. Drinking is a significant problem for 10 to 20 percent of adolescents. 11% of adolescents and 28% of high school seniors drink five or more drinks at least once a week. Over the past 20 years, uh, the life expectancy for our society has gone up, except uh, in the 15 to 24 year old age group. The three leading causes of death in this age group are accidents, 
suicide, and homicide, and they're all closely linked to alcohol and drug use. So it becomes a significant problem. Now what I'll do if this, if this group wants me to, is I can make some hard copies out of this, and if you put your names on a piece of paper, I'll put together some stuff and hand it out. One of my pet peeves when I go to conferences is people don't give handouts away, so I thought I'd test you guys. Uh, <laughs> drivers age 16 to 24 comprise about 17% of the population who are involved in almost 50% of fatal accidents. Alcohol and drugs are implicated in almost all cases. <clears throat> Daily, about 14 adolescents age 16 to 19 die, and 360 are injured in alcohol-related traffic accidents. That's a 1996 statistic. Uh, it hasn't changed a great deal, interestingly. Now, just to give you that, there's a lot of interesting uh, myths about who uses drugs and who uses alcohol and who doesn't. And you'll be interested to know that in the rank prevalence of ethnic groups in the United States, the greatest use percentage-wise in adolescence is by Native Americans. The second group is whites, the third group is Hispanics, the fourth are African Americans, and very, very, very down the list are Asians. And this data doesn't include dropouts. This, is, this study was done on kids nationally that are still in high school. These squeaky floors remind me of my school years. <laughs> Now, here's some of the reasons that kids give for using drugs. Uh, and this is perceived uh, a benefit scale. Of alcohol, help them relax is about 64%, forget problems about 46%. That's sort of a scary thing. You have, have to wonder what's going on in society that kids have problems that they have to get drunk to forget. Uh, helps me be with friends who use about 40%. Friendly again, about 38%, and feel good about myself, about 30%. With drugs, uh, the numbers are pretty much the same as you go down the list. Um, uh, and these are perceived benefit scales. This stack is not going to take much longer than an hour to preach your word. I will be. Uh, some of the self reported reasons, some more. Uh, that sort of overlaps with this other one are the expanded awareness and insight. It's interesting that uh, one of my three sons uh, got into marijuana heavy. He was a true pothead when he was in his late teens and early 20s. And one of the things I heard over and over was, wow, I can really think straight when I take this stuff. Uh, he always felt that he was, uh, had more awareness and insight. And then what he didn't know was he was killing off brain cells and making the squash get a little bit rotten. Uh, a lot of the kids will tell you it's about drug effect, and that's usually a pretty high, a pretty uh, honest answer. They like to feel high, they like to change in mind state, uh, they like to be at ease with friends and feel more creative. Now, this drug effect motive is not a new phenomenon, and it's not just, uh, it's not just something that adolescents uh, like. Since recorded history, mankind has been trying new mind-altering drugs to get this kind of effect, so it's been with us forever. They also like the need to have new and exciting experiences. If how many are teachers in here, or okay, or had development courses? If you look at Erickson's or Piaget's developmental stuff, and we'll talk about that in a while. Part of adolescence is this having new experiences and to satisfy curiosity. If that's done properly. That's an extremely important part of stage sequential development of the brain and the, pers and the persona. Uh, <clears throat> it turns out that drugs actually slow that up. These all show an altered state of consciousness as an important motivator. Uh, and psych it's very psychologically reinforcing. Addiction, by definition, is uh, uh, using something that, makes, that psychologically changes your mind. Now here's Montana stats. These are from 99. This second bar is the national norm. And this will, and the, and the big darker bar is Montana. Very often people who live in states like Montana where 
it's a nice place to live and we have a lot of nature and a lot of things going for it, think that we don't have as big a problem as anybody else in the country. And you can see from these stats that in most drugs, we're ahead of the national norm. For instance, in alcohol, this is just in teenagers, and it's in, in used in the last 30 days. Almost 45% of kids have used alcohol in the last 30 days. Cigarettes, which we now know is the primary entry drug, by the way, uh, goes neck and neck probably with alcohol. We didn't, when I was a young man, uh, that's a long time ago, we thought that alcohol, our marijuana was the primary entry drug. Cigarettes are the primary entry drug. <coughs> Hallucinogens, about 20%, again, above the national norm. Smokeless tobacco, which is, as a physician, I abhor because uh, the lesions you get in the mouth of long-term use of smokeless tobacco are bad for those bears. Amelanotic melanomas, which can develop, are killers. That's one of the worst cancers you can have. Uh, sedatives aren't quite so popular here, but way ahead of the national norm. Marijuana, we're a little behind the national norm. Stimulants, uh, I'm not sure this was reported out accurately because I see a lot of kids using methamphetamine. Uh, inhalants, and I'll talk about inhalants in a few minutes, they really do bad things to your central nervous system. Cocaine, heroin, and any other drug. Now, I didn't see the questionnaire. Actually, I have it, but I didn't read it, I should say. I was interested when I looked at this and looked at stimulants and what I imagined to know about stimulants, that if they ask that as methamphetamine, a lot of kids don't know the crank is methamphetamine. And so uh, they may have added that properly. Uh, <coughs> Here's a bar graph that shows the percentage of probationers and non-probation respondents who have used drugs in the past 30 days. And as you can see, all the same drugs we had on the other graph. And the probationers, who are not supposed to be using any of this stuff, uh, use a lot more of it. All the way down the line. <coughs> I have probably five or six of these graphs, or tables. Uh, and it just shows this is alcohol, tobacco, and other drugs, ATOD. Percentage of academic grades. Uh, if you look at lifetime use, and that's, that, this uh, questionnaire went up to 19. Um, the number of kids who have used alcohol in their lifetime that are A students is still 61%. But that means A drink when they'd ask this question. If you look at the number that are having our Fs, uh, a high percentage of them are using alcohol. And if this were an accurate table, it would probably show more chronicity. In fact, down here it does a little bit. The last 30 days, 27% of the A students were drinking, 68% of the F students were drinking. Marijuana, 9%. This is significant when we start talking about marijuana because of what it does to learning, uh, 53%. Cigarettes, 13%, 70% roughly. Any drugs, 30, 82, etc. Everybody understand that table? It's sometimes a little confusing. <laughs> Here's a, uh, I have another one of these that actually has six phases uh, instead of four, but this is okay. Uh, the phases of the chemical use. No, and essentially, no one gets dependent upon a chemical the first time they use it. Uh, the experimental phase is the first phase, it's, and you use drug in a social setting, and you're usually responding to peer pressure. Uh, you learn a euphoric high, and you get a few drugs from your friends. Now, there's a second phase in the other scheme of things, it's called social use, where every time you're around friends, you tend to use the drugs. You tend not to use them alone, etc. And then there's the active seeking phase, where you start getting your own supply of drugs. <coughs> you. Uh, See, you're, you're looking for that mental change, uh, of that uh, change in the mental state. Uh, the user will usually modulate the dose for the desired effect. And at this stage, very often, they're beginning to get some uh, tolerance. So it take, let's say, the first time they had a drink, one drink buzzed them, and they felt good. Maybe they need three drinks the time they're here. And they always get high. And high can be defined, it's the general term up, down, wavy, any way you want to put it. 
Third is the preoccupation, and the preoccupation is what we call dependency. There's loss of control, they can't cope without the drugs. Uh, the future orientation is the next high, and they use compulsively. Burnout actually, in most schemes, go on the end of this, and they're using drugs primarily to prevent the negative effects from withdrawal. Uh, all withdrawal has some sort of dysphoria associated with it, and uh, by taking the drugs, sort of like the morning after drink, uh, you take that dysphoria away. Now, <coughs> when you look at adolescence, same applies to adults, but particularly in adolescents. The early onset of drug use predicts subsequent use of alcohol and drugs. When I get kids uh, in treatment who are starting to use at eight and nine, they worry me a lot more than like the kid I have now, I was actually his young man, who had his first use of anything at 19, and precipitated, I think, maybe because of his mother's death. But uh, if they start using early, then they have a much more, uh, a much poorer prognosis. Early onset of that and frequency uh, essentially equals extensive and persistent uh, use of more dangerous drugs. Everybody knows that. Association with drug use and peers. There's some other slides that will tell a little more about this. Has been consistently found to be amongst the strongest predictions of substance use. Uh, substance use. This makes sense because the association brings together a number of critical factors. The one, the number one factor in the use of drugs is availability. If you're on an island and you didn't have any drugs, you'd never have a problem. So if there's availability, that's the number one problem. And the reason that there tends to be a lot of debate uh, between the people that believe in intercession or stopping drug flow and the people who think that that may not be as effective as treatment is because of that fact. Now the problem, I mean I agree that intercession, intercession is very important, we're not doing it effectively. Another strong factor is the need to fit in and then all the psycholo psychological and social reinforcement that you get from using your friends. With different drugs, there becomes some social phenomena that is very important to the use. And one of the best and most studied examples of that is in heroin users. <clears throat> heroin users almost never don't share needles because part of heroin abuse, heroin abuse culture is sharing a needle. It's part of, it's sort of like passing a pipe around. Uh, and, in fact, it's like a kid with a bong. If they're in that culture and they have a pipe, they usually pass that pipe. So there's a social thing that goes with using that drug. Heroin, heroin addiction is the greatest example of that. Uh, if a heroin addict tells me they never shared needles, that's an automatic lie. It just doesn't happen. Early and persistent problem behaviors. Some children appear to be at greater risk from drug use by virtue of individual temperament and early problem behavior problems. It depends upon the variety, the frequency, and the seriousness. All kids get in a little trouble because part of growing up is experimenting with different parts of life, and sometimes that winds up not being all that red hot. There's a difference between that and the, and the young person that attempts to find a great amount of variety in the kind of trouble that they get into. Uh, and the frequency they do it and the seriousness of what they do. Observed traits are predictive of later tobacco, alcohol, and drug use are frequent ne negative mood states, uh, withdrawal, slow adaptability to change, aggressive behavior, behavior and hyperactivity. <coughs> I can see it too. Get bored, I'll see. Uh, factors contributed to ongoing alcohol and drug use. Uh, that means after they began, uh, are physical addiction, disease, or physical factors, related medical problems, inherited risk, or genetics, which plays a big role. Uh, adolescent hormonal factors, we're learning more and more about the role that hormones may play in uh, certain drugs and what certain drugs do to hormones. Uh, 
the level of physical development and mental disorders. Psychological factors, social skills, emotional level, self-image, attitude towards life, defense mechanisms. I noticed somebody was writing about resiliency over there. I've been to a number of workshops on adolescent drugs and the use of resiliency in helping kids. Uh, phenomenally, and a very, very important factor. Uh, sociological factors are ethnicity, cultural differences, uh, family background, education, employment, peer relationships, and school environment. There's one that's not on there, uh, and it's called religiosity. And religiosity does not mean, it only means by the researchers in attending church with your parents. It doesn't mean that you belong to this church, that church, the other church, but it's just the fact that, and I think it has to do with parents and kids being together and doing things together, particularly in environments that tend to be positive. Uh, but there's a strong association. <coughs> This is another way to put that, and the following lantern slides actually follow this. So just to reiterate a little bit, family factors, early behavior, school factors, attitudes, peer associations, early onset, you see that over and over, and contextual factors are all predictive risk factors. Family factors. Family modeling of drug use behavior and permissive parental attitudes toward the child's use predicted greater use for alcohol and drug abuse. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, my wife and I were in Ireland and watching TV, and I saw one of the most powerful commercials for drug abuse in kids that I've ever seen. I've never seen it in this country. <coughs> and the words came on, and the narrator said, drug abuse begins at home. And he started panning across the kitchen which in most Irish homes are fairly small. And the first thing they panned in on was a big bottle of Guinness and a bottle of Irish whiskey. And then as the camera panned across to a cupboard, it showed a bunch of prescription drugs, and then it panned into a dark corner showing needles and that kind of stuff. Very powerful commercial. Very often, this stuff begins at home. Uh, poor parenting practices, and a low degree of bonding between parents and children. Children increase the risk. <coughs> Unclear expectations for behavior. Poor parental monitoring of behavior. Few and inconsistent rewards for positive behavior. And excessively severe and inconsistent punishment. Uh, excessively severe gets into areas of abuse, which are not good. And inconsistent punishment is very bad. High levels of conflict within the family are predictive of alcohol and drug abuse. If I were God, parenting classes would be a mandatory for everybody. So that's a problem. Is that being recorded? <laughs> <laughs> Contextual factors. The broader community within which a child grows up contributes to drug abuse risk. The community values and norms influence drug availability as well as standards for behavior. In highly disorganized neighborhoods with a high population tendency and a lot of turnover, uh, as well as physical deterioration and low levels of attachment are much more risky. The crack epidemics uh, in the beginning permeated the particularly African-American ghettos in the big cities. Uh, the interesting thing is that the early work that was done on resiliency by a lot of child and adolescent psychiatrists, etc., cetera, uh, were done because they observed kids in these unbelievably bad environments coming through. And they started asking, what's different between this kid and the kid that lives next door? And that's where a lot of early observations, interviews actually, and observations about resiliency came through. <coughs> what do you think one of the most important defense mechanisms is when it comes to resiliency? Anybody? Humor. Humor. Very important. And kids that could laugh at things uh, tended to get along better than kids that took them very seriously and internalized. Attitudinal factors. In late childhood and early adolescence, a set of attitudes and associations have been shown to predict risk for alcohol and drug use. These include alienation from the dominant values, 
low religiosity, and rebelliousness. It's important to understand, I'm not trying to sell religion, but this is very important. I think that would be important if that thing took place even in the home. But that sort of thing is very important. <coughs> School factors. This is interesting because in the 70s, when I was in medical school, because I went back when I was an old guy, um, the, one of the common myths were that intelligent people don't get in trouble with drugs. It's really dummies that get in trouble with drugs. There's been many studies. No relationship between low intelligent and drug abuse. School failure beginning late in elementary grades increases the risk for adolescent alcohol and drug abuse. Now, if you read these studies, this does not mean failing kids from advancement. It means dealing with kids in a way that they feel that they're a failure. You could, if you had a kid that was so slow he just couldn't go from two to three, uh, there's good ways to deal with that and bad ways to deal with that. But you don't, you want to minimize the perception of failure. Achievement problems may result from early behavior problems, learning disabilities, failure to motivate, and they're, as we all know, more than just the teacher involved in the motivation. And in fact, uh, the parents probably play as or a more important role in motivation. Um, loss of commitment to educational pursuits is indicated by little time spent on homework, truancy, and a perception that the coursework is irrelevant. Now, this is important. All risk factors are modifiable. All the risk factors that we just talked about can be changed. And regardless of what your role is, and when you're dealing with adolescents, it's important to understand that they're all modifiable. In my opinion, everybody working with adolescents needs to, in some unified way, help to modify those rather than pointing fingers and blaming. That doesn't get anybody. <coughs> talk a little bit about alcohol because first that's good Jim. <laughs> kidding. Uh, because I don't think I think that we tend to skate around alcohol because it's legal, it seems to be in many cases uh, socially the thing to do. And I'm not carrying nations. If you can drink and get away with it, you should have fun. But I think we need to look at the we need to realistically look at the impact of our attitudes on adolescents. And I remember, uh, and I regret this, as a young father, essentially uh, enculturing my children to drinking. And if I could do that over again, I would never do that that it was cool. I mean, I know lots of parents that uh, force beer down toddlers' throats just to watch them wobble. Not a good idea. Uh, homicide, suicides, and unintentional injuries, we talked about that account for 80% of teenage deaths. 50% of the time it involves alcohol. And, remarkably, the other 50% of the time, it almost always uses some of the drug involved. Not always, but almost always. 50% of non-fatal motor accidents, uh, alcohol, 33% of high school seniors, and 24% of 10th graders, and 13% of 8th graders admit to getting drunk at least once every two weeks. This is important. Teenage social drinking is a myth. Now, it's always dangerous to generalize, but I'm going to do it. I, kids don't drink socially. They drink to get a buzz, period. They, they drink to get a change in mind state. Only 48% of high school seniors felt that there was a health risk involved with drinking five or more drinks every two weeks. So somehow we're doing something wrong. The alcohol beverage industry, I should never start down that road, makes and markets beverages specifically for young adults and adolescents. And they do it very effectively. Uh, in many, many ways. Mm. 
Now this has changed just a little bit since I made this lantern slide. That shows how old I am, doesn't it? Lantern slide. <laughs> when I used to have carbide. Anyway, we now know that the GABA receptors, the GABA amino butyric acid receptors in the brain that the ones that sort of put us to sleep and sedate us, are one of the primary receptors that alcohol works at. But we don't know all of the receptors where alcohol works. And we, one of the things we do know is that alcohol makes cell membranes permeable or leaky. And so the cells don't work right. And the, one of the dangers with alcohol is it affects every organ system in the body when it's used excessively. And so it's very pervasive uh, in the damage you can do uh, to the body when it's used excessively. It causes nerve cells to expand and become more fluid, uh, interferes with normal neuronal connections. Uh, proteins in the cell wall tend to get dissolved out. Information processing becomes disrupted. Uh, just as an example of this, there's a number of studies where they've done, uh, now they're doing MRIs, they started out with CAT scans, uh, looking at alcoholics' brains. And a normal 40-year-old alcoholic male and a 35-year-old alcoholic female have the brain shrinkage that's roughly equivalent to an 80-year-old non-drinker. So it really ages the brain pretty purely. Information processing becomes disrupted. <coughs> it causes an increased production of, these are neurotransmitters, serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And the reason that alcohol has so many effects on a person is because, for instance, norepinephrine in the brain is a stimulator. It makes us get active and get going. Uh, when we get up in the morning and take a cold shower, lots of norepinephrine is popped out. Serotonin, on the other hand, it, and so is dopamine a stimulator, is the one that relaxes us. And <clears throat> one of the reasons that warm milk at bedtime tends to help you sleep is because it's full of tryptophan, and tryptophan is the precursor to serotonin. So this helps sedate us. And you know, if, you, if, if any of you have been drinking, you might notice that you become very active and feel full of energy, and all of a sudden you might just sort of go down and want to go to sleep. Alcohol has a disinhibitory effect on adolescence, cause, causing diminished judgment uh, and increased impulsiveness. Alcohol affects mood. I just said that energizes you at first and then begins depressing you. Uh, as blood alcohol level rises, memory concentration and insight are dull, and continued drinking uh, leads to emotional liability and lots of mood swings. This is another one. You don't want to see that again. Let's talk about marijuana. Um, as you probably know, uh, marijuana comes from the leaves and the stems of a plant called cannabis sativa. There's actually three uh, species of cannabis, but the most powerful one is sativa. The flowers of the plant produce a resin which is turned into hashish. Uh, it's designated as a euphoriant or a hallucinogen because in high doses it makes you hallucinate. Um, the active ingredient is delta-9 tetrahydrocodavinol. I put that in just because you know I'm a doctor that way, because that's a big word. Uh, and there's a bunch of active ingredients, but the big one is delta THC. Uh, when it's inhaled, uh, the effects will begin about the onset of effects for about five to ten minutes, and they last about thirty minutes. Uh, you'll get a little anxiety. In fact, one of the things I used to do a lot of ER work, and one of the things you see in first-time users of marijuana is that they get very anxious and very often they wind up in the emergency room because they're jumping out of their skin and they actually almost look a little delirious sometimes. That's followed by a feeling of well-being. People tend to, the person using this tends to get introspective and quiet. Uh, there's a perception of time and space that's altered. Uh, appetite is almost always increased and, and the pockets call that the munchies. Uh, large doses called paranoia, delusions, and hallucinations. It's rapidly cleared from the blood, but it's highly lipid soluble. How much, what percent of the brain is fat? Lipid? 80%. You can take brain slices out of people who have died who have used heavy marijuana, and a year after they quit using it, there's still the presence of marijuana. 
So delta THC is sitting right up there next to these brain cells with a fat next to the brain cells storing this stuff, affecting the brain cells. Um, I've had people in treatment that were really heavy pot users who had uh, positive urines after 30 days, uh, and I was pretty sure they weren't using the treatment. I don't spend a lot of time on this. You have acute reactions. Red eyes is one of the ways if you have kids at home that you can often tell that the kids are smoking. Uh, they tend to not track well with their brain, uh, and they have poor coordination, almost like they're intoxicated. One of the myths in the early days of the, of the re-emergence of marijuana in our society was it was safer than alcohol. The Army did the one of the definitive studies on the effects of marijuana on coordination. And they had people who they gave marijuana to who were probably tickled with that uh, for, for about a month, every day, marijuana, and people who got no marijuana. And they had a lot of low cannons. Really, no-brainer, simple task, okay? Non-marijuana users loaded cannons twice as fast and didn't miss the, the port uh, than the marijuana users. And so they said, oh, this does affect coordination. <coughs> uh, just like cigarettes, if it's used chron chronically, it can cause lung inflammation and you get precancerous bronchial changes. Uh, it alters the endocrine system. When I used to do subfertility work as a family doc, uh, one of the first things I always did when a couple were trying to get pregnant was check the mail, check the mail for sperm. Because marijuana causes what's called uh, zoospermia, where the sperm uh, develop funny, three heads, four tails, all sorts of funny sperm, okay? And the sperm count goes into the basement. And so to do a subfertility workup and not check a male for marijuana is uh, bad medicine. Short-term memory impairment, very, very, very important. It really screws up learning. Teachers that are in here probably know that from kids they do their own pot. State-dependent learning is also followed up. So they not only have problems with just learning facts, they have problems with stage-dependent development, okay? And the old famous amotivational syndrome. That was argued a long time. We now know that it exists. That heavy marijuana users uh, tend not to want to do much. Uppers are stimulants. Cocaine, uh, it comes in two forms. The hydrochloride, which uh, is uh, water soluble and so it can be dissolved and shot up uh, or it can be snorted. It actually can be introduced into any orifice in the body. And freebase, which is merely made by dissolving cocaine hydrochloride and putting sodium bicarbonate into it so it becomes basic in the ancient and chemically basic and it settles out. And then you pour the water off, and in the pans you have this cake, uh, and when it dries, it cracks. And that's how it got its name, crack. Uh, some of the street names are Coke, O, Tube, Snow, and the uh, base is crack, base, bazooka. Amphetamines, the most abused one in our society is methamphetamine, which is crank or meth or crystal. Dextroamphetamine is hard to get now because uh, in the 60s, there was a rash, a rash no pun intended, of deaths amongst uh, female military dependents. And the, the military doctors at that time didn't know any better and were giving a lot of dextra amphetamine out for weight reduction. And usually these were women. The pillow uh, <laughs> that did not come off of me. <laughs> the, uh, they would take this stuff, and of course when you take amphetamines, you go up, it's an upper. And they would take amphetamines for two or three months, and what happens when you come off of uppers? Down, not to normal, down to the basement. And so they would have a lot of post-amphetamine depression and kill themselves. So as a result of the Army and Navy doing those studies, they took this off the market, and it's really uh, in, for instance, in the state of Washington, you can't even describe it, I don't know about Montana. Uh, Dextroamphetamine was used in the 40s and 50s, particularly to keep pilots awake on long missed missions. Amphetamine, other amphetamine-like drugs uh, 
are Rivlin, Preludin, uh, uh, Siler, Fast, and Attenuate. Now, I've, I have actually treated people that have been addicted to all of those. Uh, it's less common with things like Attenuate. Ritalin, in adolescence, when it's used for ADHD, uh, has what's called a paradoxical response in the brain, and they bring them down. There's a lot of debate still about using Ritalin after puberty, and uh, some people debate it's good, and some people debate it's not good, uh, and I honestly don't know. Uh, in my practice, I use very little Ritalin because I'm not convinced that's always a problem. Lookalikes which kids use, are usually drugs that can, uh, contain bugs. No, phenylpropanolamine, <laughs> phenylpropanolamine uh, is a common drug that's in cold remedies. Uh, there's actually some new data I've just been reading on it. It may be dangerous in a lot of ways. Highly, it's in everything, and it's a stimulant. And uh, kids will, when they can't get anything in it, anything else, will often go to drugstores and buy a lot of over-the-counter cold remedies and take them buzzed. Ephedrine is in a lot of full remedies, and of course caffeine is around. <coughs> Nicotine is in the adults. Downers. What time did I start? Well, I should be almost finished for now. Okay. The uh, downers at this point in time are not a favorite street drug like they used to be. Uh, barbiturates used to be very popular on the streets, and they're still around, but they're not really in like they used to be. I treat a lot of elderly people who get hooked on on uh, benzodiazepines, particularly Xanax. That's a killer in old people. They get hooked. It's a very, very addicting drug. And Ativan is not good to use for long periods of time. Uh, in the 50s and into the 60s, uh, second all was abused on the street a lot. They were called red devils or reds. And that's because they came in a capsule that was red. Nemutol uh, came in a yellow capsule, and hence was called yellow jackets. Uh, some of the other sedative hypnotics are Doradin, uh, which used to be called uh, goofballs. Colludes, uh, which are terrible in, in the 60s, were the most abused prescription drug that was out there. And it turns out that, uh, has everybody heard of Soma? Anybody know about Soma? So it's used as a muscle relaxant. <coughs> Soma in the liver is changed in the methylone and is very addicting. And I shudder when I, when I was doing family practice and I would see people come in and done Soma for a year. Bad news bear. Uh, That's being recorded all in the drug company manager, too. Opium. You see, you see a lot of heroin, and there's a lot of heroin in this area. Uh, one of the things that ki the kids tend to use more of is codeine. And because there's more around, hypercodone has really emerged as a popular pain medicine, and it's a good one, don't get me wrong. These drugs aren't bad things if they're used right. But these, a lot of these are used, and they sit around on the counters in the medicine cabinets, and uh, and Everybody, including this guy, tends to hoard medicine. I'm thinking, well, the Russians may attack any day, and if I have this stuff, I can go to my bunker and I'm going to be safe. And so, you can go to any house in the country, you can probably see all sorts of old meds in there. And kids love that. The kids that are abusing drugs like that stuff. And particularly if you have Vicodin. Morphine sulfate comes in a tablet also. Uh, methadone is not abused because you don't get, or rarely abused because you don't get much of a buzz off of it. But propoxyphene, which is Darvon, Darvon compound, is abused a lot by adolescents. They often can't get hold of Demerol, Meparidine. Uh, Meparidine and fentanyl tend to be abused by medical uh, uh, people when they, use, when they abuse opiates. And potassocene is a drug that's not popular uh, because it has both opiate agonist and antagonist properties. In other words, it will buzz you, but it won't buzz you. And so, but I've seen people that uh, get hooked on that. That's tall one. Are, yes? Is any of our any of those Percodan? Percodan? Or is that it? Yeah, Percodan is uh, oxycodone. Oh, there we go. Okay, yeah. I see. Percocet, Percodan, 
Roxaset is a uh, generic. Psychedelics, uh, which keep right now, well, they sort of went down and they're coming back up. LSD, of course, is a big popular one. And LSD is easy to uh, smuggle and hide and everything else because it comes in a number of forms, and one of the forms is called blotter acid. And they literally take blotter paper, it has little squares, and just put a drop on all those, and you can and you can hide them in your shoe. And uh, in fact, more LSD is probably smuggled into prison than any other given drug because it's so easy to smuggle in. It can be smuggled in on letters. You can use, you can color it and put it punctuation marks with uh, LSD. Uh, MDMA and MDA are amphetamine derivatives that uh, ecstasy is what most people know. A very dangerous drug because it can cause permanent brain damage and on occasion a psychosis that is lifelong. Uh, it's coming back. It's making a big hit again in the cities. Uh, peyote is uh, popular. Uh, peyote was used by natives in the southwest for years in a very controlled way in religious ceremonies and essentially <coughs> was not problematic in their culture <coughs> Excuse me, but when they found the uh, when when the drug culture found this stuff and of course abused it, it became very popular. Now, some of the anticholinergics that can be found in over-the-counter medicines like belladonna uh, and scopolamine. Uh, scopolamine is the truth drug of World War II in higher doses, but some of these drugs are used and they'll cause hallucinogens. PCP, we'll talk about that in a minute because that's a good one, uh, which is called angel dust on the street or hog uh, is used. And kids will even use uh, mace and nutmeg, which are hallucinogens. Uh, they take them in big doses and they get powerful belly aches, uh, but they give them a trip. Amanita mushrooms are deadly. In extremely low doses, they cause hallucinations, but most people will eat most of the mushroom, and if you eat the mushroom, it's fatal. So, not good stuff. Will they eat nothing? A big part? Yes, yeah, okay. and just nothing. Or mace. And mace is the uh, husk around the nutmeg, I think, or the other way around. And uh, uh, in high doses. Now, uh, this is all for me. Anybody want to see this? Okay. Uh, LSD, uh, which is sort of out now. Like I say, it's coming back a little bit. Uh, and the reason it's out, there was a lot of press about it, for instance, when the CIA was doing experiments with the effect of LSD on people in the uh, early 50s and killed a few people, uh, that caused bad press. Timothy Leary was a big advocate of, anybody heard of Timothy Leary? Okay. He was a big advocate of LSD and he thought that it opened our minds and all sorts of things. Uh, it should be categorized as an uh, and a lucigen because it causes illusions and, and it alters reality based perceptions. I've talked to people um, who have used a lot of LSD and they would tell me that they could listen to music and it would come out of the speakers as colors and the colors would interwind and it was, so it really uh, does, it, it gives you a trip. Um, it's rapidly absorbed from the stomach. Uh, you get a rapid pulse, high blood pressure, sweat, palpitations, and nausea. Uh, Psychological. In fact, I've had one guy tell me that the nausea, the vomiting that went along with that was even cool because he imagined that he was vomiting dragons and the dragons would come out and slither away. Uh, it's usually supplied as a tiny cylindrical tablet uh, or a micro dot. Uh, sometimes they're little tiny gelatin squares or window panes uh, or small pieces of paper. When it was really in, and it was being sold as blotter uh, LSD, each supplier had their own hallmark they put on the blotter. So some of them might look like goofies, some of them might be Mickey Mouse's, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> now this is another very dangerous drug. Oh, you don't need that. Inhalants, you know, you're gonna wonder what that's what that said, aren't you? <laughs> bad because they're all extremely dangerous to brain tissue and can cause permanent damage. Uh, fortunately, inhalants 
are rarely used a lot. Most kids will toy with them and they've heard about what they do and they won't use them a lot. When they do use them a lot, you see a lot of changes in their mentation. Uh, all these things can be inhaled. And the, pr the primary ingredient that gives them a high is toluene, trichloroethylene, or butane sometimes. And these things are very fat soluble and dissolve fat. And so they go right to the brain and put holes in it. <clears throat> Volatile nitrites, which are used in room deodorizers, uh, amyl nitrite is one of them. The most, in fact, the most prominent one uh, <clears throat> is used to get high. Uh, nitrous oxide, which is found not oh yeah, that's still in there, very often is just in whipped cream cans. And what kids will do is take a large bag and just tip the can over, blow a whipped cream out, and just sort of breathe that in. Uh, <clears throat> nitrous oxide is not as dangerous as these things in terms of permanent damage. In fact, it's used as an anesthetic. Uh, and a couple of the anesthetics that are abused when they get hold of chloroform and ether. Ether is hard to get now because it's not used much. Chloroform is readily available. Uh, veterinarians still use quite a bit. Warning signs of inhalants, you can smell it. When the kids sniff with gasoline or glue and that stuff, you can smell them. Their, slur, their speech becomes slurred, their eyes get glassy or watery, pupils get large, they tend to stagger like I just did, uh, they lose their appetite, uh, then they get intoxicated, they're, they're, they act drunk. They will often seize on the on organic inhalants. In one study of uh, toluene abusers, that should be spray paint. Uh, Chronic users, 65% had measurable neurological damage. Now, PCP <coughs> is important to talk about for a moment because it's the most common adulterant in most street method drugs, including marijuana. If a dealer, what dealers want to do is sell more of their product, they're good, very good marketers. And if they get hold of marijuana that's not particularly hot, then they will often, very often adulterate it with PCP. So when it's smoked, the, the person that's smoking it, in this case the kid, uh, will really get high. And they think, oh, this is good stuff, we'll always buy from Dick. Uh, it can be ingested, smoked, snorted, used IV. Uh, it'll act as a depressant, a stimulant, or a hallucinogen, depending upon the dose, the route of administration, and the underlying psychology of that person. Uh, it's a dissociative anesthetic. As a matter of fact, when it was first invented, it was going to be used for an anesthetic. But they found out that too many people were hallucinating getting goofy in post-op. And, and so they thought, hmm, this doesn't work too well. Uh, it can make people very paranoid, give them a lot of uh, perceptual distortion. They get psychosis, aggressive, and violent. In fact, the stories you hear about people on PPCP uh, destroying four or five policemen in a police car are true stories. They get extremely violent on it sometimes. Flashbacks are very common, uh, etc. And the urine drug screen stays positive for uh, often a couple weeks, unlike most drug screens. Anabolic steroids uh, need mentioning because of the roughly million Americans, it's probably closer to two million now that are using steroids about half to three quarters of high school students. Uh, the illegal steroid trade, this was in 96, was 300 to 400 million dollars a year, so it's a big business. Um, the illegal cocaine trade worldwide is 152 billion dollars a year. <coughs> big business. Patterns of abuse are usually cycling and stacking, which means, cycling means some on don't take some, take some, don't take some. Stacking is you start with a small dose and work up to a large dose. The small doses are even about 10 times greater than what's normally used by physicians for various problems, and the big doses are 100 times more. Very, pretty easy uh, to see the signs of steroid use. 
um, usually it's pimples. You get, a, you get an average boy that's past puberty and past his pimple stage, uh, and now have pimples over the body. Because what it does is it kicks in, it's a male hormone, essentially, and the, and the body thinks, oh, I'm supposed to develop again. And so that's how it puts on muscle mass. What was that boxing match we watched the other night when Tyson, that guy wouldn't come back out in the ring? I would bet everything I own, I hope this doesn't go to anybody important, that he was on steroids because his opponent had pimples all over his body and he was almost 30 years old. Not good. Aggressive and violent behavior is common. <coughs> the, some of the SS units during World War II uh, and part of the WAP and SS uh, units use a combination of steroids and amphetamine to make them mean. They could fight longer and they were more mean and they killed more effectively. And they used those drugs purposely for that reason. Uh, dependency syndromes are being reported with actually some withdrawal. We didn't used to think people got dependent on steroids. We're starting to change our thinking. seen with kids who are using drugs when we talk about dual diagnosis and the definition of dual diagnosis, diagnosis is debated quite a bit. But you very often see both as a result of drug use and a concurrent psychiatric diagnosis. Mood disorders, particularly depression, uh, and kids become uh, expansive and very irritable. Conduct disorders and antisocial personality disorders and anxiety disorders. I just read a review article today on uh, depressed teenagers, and uh, there's a lot more out there than we're diagnosing. That also worries me. Now, quickly, I'm going to talk just a little bit about what drugs do to development, and we'll try to get you out of here. In short, the chronic use of drugs in adolescence uh, causes developmental lag. Um, and this, this includes all drugs. Now, some drugs are worse than others in some ways. Mar chronic use of marijuana uh, really impacts us, and the chronic use of alcohol really impacts us. Uh, when underlying neuropsychological substrate, that means the brain, uh, is impaired, and when action is curtailed, um, the interaction with a potentially disequilibrium environment is reduced, uh, develop, uh, is reduced, development will be uh, relatively retarded. What that means in plain English is that in order for you, in order for a child to go from pre-adolescent to adolescent to adulthood, there's a series of changes that take place and those changes are effect affected by a constant interrelationship with everything around that child. So that includes <clears throat> bad times as well as good times. That includes social interactions. That includes interactions with the parents, with the teachers, and all with the peers, and on and on and on. Now, the brain is constantly processing, and in a healthy, developing child, the the progress is a positive progress so that for instance they have a bad, they break up with a, a guy breaks up with his girlfriend or vice versa that's painful if they deal with that pain in a in a positive way the next time it happens it's a little less painful and or the way they approach the relationship becomes more mature and that's called stage sequential development now what drugs do and when they're talking about action that means action in the brain and in this stuff uh, what this says is that the adolescent needs this equilibrating environment in order to grow. If you are in a perfect environment all your life, uh, and we've actually seen this, and some sociologists have done some great studies on advantaged kids in England that were brought up in boarding schools, pampered, da 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 da, -da they develop different than kids in public schools who are faced with different types of challenges. And so you need this dis dis 
uh, uh, equilibrium in your environment in order to grow. What do drugs do? They numb that. They, they, they essentially erase that. If, you have a, if you've been around kids that are heavy pot smokers, they really don't care what goes on around them. It's sort of like, it's okay. Everything's cool. I can handle this. And, it's, and it, so it, it stifles that development. The adolescent begins transitional passage but fails to negotiate it and remains in limbo. And what we see in treatment settings, <coughs> excuse me, where you can really observe kids is that they come in in this sort of limbo, numb state, and as they get clean, uh, and if you see them a few months later, they may be a 16-year-old that acts like a 13-year-old because in using those drugs, they didn't have uh, the kind of mental, psychological, uh, and psychic challenges they need in order for social growth, psychological growth. Make sense? Okay. Let well, anybody say no. Drugs really impact this. There's a direct pharmacological action. There's a failure to cultivate commitment to adaptive integration and a failure to expand the range of social interactions and conceptions. And so if you read Piaget, the stage sequential development takes place at the cutting edge. Uh, we're, we all, how many times have you heard the saying that uh, when so, you have a bad day, somebody will say it builds character? There's a lot of truth in that statement. When you're dealing with problems, and you deal with them, and you solve them properly, you grow. If you don't have to deal with problems, you can't grow. Um, <coughs> developmental regression occurs if the highest level of cognitive organization is stripped away by procreation substance use. Drugs, and, drugs impede the progress from concrete. Little kids are concrete. Everything's black and white. And when we become adult, if we're lucky, we, do, we process things in our mind which, in ways that are called formal operations. There's rarely blacks and whites. We think about what's good about this, what's good about that, and there's all sorts of measuring going on. Whether you're talking about a relationship, or you're talking about a job, or you're talking about driving the car. And little kids, it's black and white. They essentially know what their parents have taught them. Uh, and so drugs will impede that progress from the concrete stage of development to the formal operation stage. They introduce instability uh, in the incompletely consolidated formal operation schemes. Um, chronic drug involvement uh, will mark entrance into a peer culture that merely recapitulates an earlier form of social interaction which centers around play. Part of stage sequential development <coughs> takes us from being little children where play is the primary, the primary importance in our life to adults where work is of primary importance, families, all sorts of things. Not play. Play usually becomes secondary. And what happens if you use it in chronic use of drugs, the culture that they use those drugs in are a play-centered culture. And there's a hiatus in identity, identity formation, uh, et cetera. I want to tell you, the guy that wrote this stuff was not a physician. He uses bigger words than I do. This is just a reiteration of that. The drugs inhibit stage sequential development. They have, you can't differentiate between work and play. It reinforces a sense of being special. Now, one of the things we like to do with kids as we enculture them is to instill in their minds that they are special. But at some point in their in development, they understand that that's not really true. They're sort of special, but there's other things that are sort of special too. And if you use drugs chronically, they don't begin to understand that trade-off. Drugs tend to promote a false conscious of a consciousness of reality. They enable the avoidance of realistic confrontation with demands of the environment. Drugs allow the consolidation of cultural relativism uh, and negative identity characteristics of uh, early adolescents. Early adolescents generally have a very negative identity. The entry from childhood into adolescence 
and on the way to going into adulthood. It's, it tends to be a, a psychologically sort of painful process. And so they feel very negative, negative about that change. There's body changes, there's mental changes, and there's all sorts of changes, and they can become confusing. And using drugs sort of stays, keeps that confusion in place. Drug use masquerades as an, emancip an emancipatory effort. Uh, they think that they're more adult and doing things the way they want to do them, but in fact the drugs really uh, prolong this childish pattern of interaction. It, it's like that in adults too. All you have to do is go into your local watering hole about midnight one time and you'll see a lot of childish behavior. Um, Adolescent drug use, we've been through some of this stuff. The psychosocial dysfunction includes escapism, egocentrism, external loss of control, self derogation, and alienation. This is the last one. They become very powerful substitutes. They, they're used to produce an illusion of power, control, and achievement. And that happens at the expense of effortful activity, which would normally produce ego enhancement. Uh, I've never seen a kid yet that achieves true ego enhancement by using drugs. They relieve psychosocial discomfort, which is dealt with in a healthy manner, which when dealt with in a healthy manner, leads to psychosocial growth. Uh, now, these are fast. Here's some of the key results of recovery. Um, if you look at school disciplinary action, uh, and the number of students for this one were 468. Of the kids that had been using drugs, six, 268 relapsed and 200 state abstinence. And they followed those kids and they looked at how they changed in a psychosocial way. The, any disciplinary action was about 20% lower in the, in the uh, abstinent group. Now the study was done in about a year, I mean about six months. So the abstinence time for this group was really short when we think of abstinence. The number of kids sent to the principal was about half in the abstinent group. Family conferences were way down from 15% in the relapse group to 3%. Uh, probation, probation, another discipline, dropped a little bit. Suspension dropped in half, and expulsion dropped about in half. So becoming abstinent from drugs uh, showed some effects in that study. Here's a study that showed post-treatment arrest by recovery status. Any arrest in a relapse group was uh, this is a bigger group, almost 1,826. Uh, any arrest in a relapse group was 43%. The abstinence group was down at 18%. Uh, a status offense went from 13% to 2%. Possession of alcohol went from 17% to 1%. Misdemeanors from 33% to 15 and felonies. I don't know what happened here. <laughs> <coughs> if I were not reasonably honest, I would have taken it off that slide. Uh, here's, here's the effect of using peers. Uh, if you look at uh, most, of, most or all of the friends use, only about 12% of this treated group remained abstinent. We can just bump down to none of their friends used and 75% remained abstinent. So the effect of the peer group on the kids and using drugs and alcohol is very powerful, which you don't need me to tell you don't remember that. It's true for adults as well. I'm sorry? I imagine it's, it's almost as true for adults. Yeah, uh, very much so. And support group tenants, there was a lot of debate for a, a while whether or not we should use 12 step stuff with adolescents. And I think that the treatment programs that have stayed reasonably open-minded and have modified that a little, <coughs> excuse me, so it's more palatable to kids, uh, still think it works best. And this statistic sort of supports that. 
support groups take on many forms. They can be AA, NA, uh, and there's groups for just adolescents, etc. Uh, there's also groups called SOS and Atheists in Recovery and all sorts of things. But the support group is probably more important, in my opinion, than the philosophy that, ex that exposes, exposes. Uh, the ones that never went or stopped going had about a 24% absence rate. The, these figures are not really great figures because we don't know all the other variables. Uh, the people who went two or four times a week had a 67% abstinence rate. So it goes up with the amount of, and in the bottom line, it's involved in it. Just like building muscle. The harder you work, the more muscle you build. Or anything you do, if you do, you, if you do it well, it takes work. Um, I will be glad to attempt to answer any questions. Yes? A question about uh, the developmental lag. Yeah. Would you include tobacco in, uh, in no. any contributing no. to the developmental lag? There's beginning, we're beginning to see some studies on tobacco, but they're very, very early studies. Um, and I, don't, I can't even tell you that I've seen anything that can show a direct relationship. Yes, ma'am. Um, early on, you did um, preference and benefit scale. Is there a predictor counterpart to that? Predictor for, what? For early intervention. Predictor of which benefits would appeal to kids and therefore they may choose to be kind. Oh, why do they use those drugs? Yeah. If, yeah I, <clears throat> probably the most powerful. Um, one of the availability is number one, okay, and that uh, goes without saying. One of the more powerful predictors is probably the quality of the family environment, uh, which means how that family uses, let's say they just use alcohol. Uh, if they use drugs, that puts us into another category. But if they use alcohol, they use alcohol responsibly. Uh, and it, it's a family that uh, <clears throat> shows a lot of love, uh, has respect for one another, etc. Uh, powerful, powerful predictor. However, in certain environments, even in the best families, uh, kids can be swayed into using by their peers. Peers are right up there uh, with that family. Good family, bad peers is a battle. Make, did I answer your question right? Sort of. Actually, as we were concrete um, assessment tool. Say that again? A test, a scale of you oh. know, which benefits are appealing and therefore this person may be prone to use marijuana or... Is there a t I understand you say, is there a test we can give? Is there one that exists, yeah. Uh, by doing a good psychosocial history on kids, uh, you could probably do some predicting. There's a, there's, a, there's a researcher named uh, Cloninger who originally came from Sweden, who now is at St. Louis University, uh, who actually took three traits in kids in the third grade. Uh, one was harm avoidance. Uh, there were three of them, I don't remember them all. Uh, and he, he looked at kids and measured them by how much uh, they showed these three different traits, and he predicted, and quite accurately, whether or not they would become alcoholic uh, when they got older. Uh, at that time in Sweden, the primary drug to worry about was alcohol, and uh, I haven't seen anything on, else on the other drugs. Now, the school systems are developing, uh, and I think in some of them have in place, uh, questionnaires that can uh, do some predictive things. There's some uh, legal issues with all of that because you, people have to be careful about how and what kind of questions they ask people. And uh, very often, some of the questionnaires that have been tried by, for instance, addiction people uh, are just answered wrong because people essentially think it's another, no, nobody's business. Uh, people who are do social work. Uh, can go into homes and you, you, you get a feeling, you have a feeling uh, based upon what you observe and how the parents are for whether how the kids are going to do. 
and I'm sure that's true for most of, most professions that touch on kids. Uh, you develop a feeling based upon observation for future problems. Does that answer your question? Sort of? Okay. I'll meet with you now. Yes? Um, I mean, this is kind of a pragmatic I'm going to walk down here because <clears throat> I'm old and I'm too vain to buy hearing. This is kind of, I think, a pragmatic question. You mentioned using resiliency to yes. assist kids in, um, in coping with How would you use it? How would you use those things to yeah. assist kids? That's a good question. <coughs> uh, based on my observations of adolescents and my opinion, uh, there's, some, there's some things that <coughs> we're finding in adolescents that I think have evolved in our modern society that play a large role in this. And <coughs> when I was in the Tri-Cities in Washington State, uh, we developed an adolescent program uh, which I call value-based treatment. And what we did is we, we went from the assumption that most of the kids we saw uh, had little or no value system for very various reasons. Uh, well, little or no, period. And so we started introducing a lot of values into, tried to introduce a lot of values in their life. Now, when you can identify characteristics in kids <clears throat> that give them resiliency, like humor, uh, or the ability to uh, dodge uh, bad peers, whatever, uh, then you try in treatment to strengthen those. One first thing you do is you try to tease them out. You try to find out what's good, good about that kid. All of them, almost all of them have good. There's some good there, not just bad. And you try to find out what's good, and you try to help them nurture those <clears throat> characteristics they have, which are positive, so that they can use them uh, as they try to adapt uh, through life with, let's say, a lot of negative peers around them, or a bad family life, or whatever. So it's really, uh, First you identify, and then you um, you try to uh, promote the use of those positive characteristics. Now tied with that is this value thing, is that if they don't have positive characteristics, it's amazing, uh, if you don't mind me just going off to the side for a moment. <clears throat> when, you, when I've done groups with kids, and you ask a kid to, to describe what love is to them, the variety of answers you get, including some very good answers, and they start to process and understand that as they look at that value, they, they, they get in touch with something within themselves that can be very positive. Uh, and some of the values I like are base values, love, honor, uh, respect, and those sorts of things. And uh, those tie together with a lot of the inherent character characteristics in children uh, that, you, that you magnify. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think it was very interesting when you put that overhead up that described the effect that alcohol has on kids. <coughs> of, uh, mm, gosh, I've forgotten it. Oh, it's, it's, it's the, but it seemed like a list of criminal behavior thing. Yeah, right. It's an exact list right. of, of, of the drugs keep the kids in that sort of mode. Yeah, they do. And, uh, but that thinking, I mean, is it the drugs or, or is it the alcohol where they're trying to get away from their family situation and they don't have the tools in which to change? Everything you said is right. I mean, it's, it's all interconnected. It's all interconnected. It's, it's and and, and it, really, it really brings forth narcissistic traits. Yeah. And, uh, and, one could argue that a lot of criminal thinking is very narcissistic, and so <clears throat> the uh, that it all ties together. We don't. I don't believe anymore. There was a time when I may have believed that uh, uh, 
uh, as in adults, that the drugs and alcohol cause the kids problems. I don't believe that. I think many kids do medicate in order to try to get away from their problems. The problem, the, the, the coincidence, the irony of that, is that in using those drugs and that alcohol to get away from the problem, they set up a new set of problems. As a matter of fact, they often make the original problem worse. Um, but there's, I don't believe, particularly with adolescents, there's any simplistic answer. I do know, and I believe very strongly, that in order to help kids uh, effectively, the first thing you have to do is get drugs and alcohol out of their life. Because you can't process with a clear brain when it's always fogged up with something. So, I mean, even the psychiatrists who used to not, some of them didn't used to agree with that, they now know that they won't try effective psychotherapy, either in adults or adolescents, that haven't got some clearing in their brain. Um, but but it's, uh, it, it's a very complex thing, and I, I mean, uh, I think that, uh, again, if I were God, I would make, I would, I would make society uh, reevaluate priorities. I think the priorities a lot of the things that used to give strength to the society were slipping away a little bit. Uh, and, and don't have to be lost, they can be regained. <coughs> yes? If kids have missed this stage development because they've been under the influence of drugs and alcohol, what's the best way to get them to go back through those stages? Back to where? I mean, don't they have to do those stages that they missed while they were under the influence? Yeah. What's the best way to get them to go back and go through those stages? The, the, there are actually programs, uh, not many, that do a lot of that because they tend to have the kids for a long period of time. In short periods of time, you can't do it. The only way you can do it is with a lot of outpatient work. Uh, and they can play catch up. Now, the interesting thing, uh, and I'm sure you all know this, with a young brain, they're amazing. And if they're clear, they can play catch up pretty effectively. Most kids can really cook if their brains are clear. And so with good counseling or whatever, uh, <clears throat> or however you do it, if the brain's clear, then you can bring them along pretty fast. The thing that's probably important is, and you ask, that's a very good question, is to recognize that they may need to play catch up and to affect that by the way you counsel or treat or whatever you do with them. Uh, so you're not already, you're not, one foot's in the, f in the path that's part of the future and one foot's in the path that's a little back there and you're just bringing them up, you know. Mm -hmm. I want to go home, I bet. <laughs> yes, sir. You, mean that, um, you mentioned uh, Native American was number one. Adolescent, that overall, that's a national study, and the good the, the good news is <clears throat> that, that uh, some of the most effective programs, unfortunately, there's not enough of, them, but some of the most effective programs are run by natives. The Navajo right now are putting a lot of capital in terms of human capital and money. Uh, into their programs to defeat alcoholism, drug abuse on their, on their nation. And it's, it is pretty effective. Um, there's, a, there's a phenomenal film, uh, I'm not sure I remember the name of it, but I could get it for it if you wanted to, about a, about a tribe up in British Columbia called the Alki Lake Tribe. Have you ever seen that? They went from 100% drunk, it's a small tribe, about 300 people, I think, 400. But they went from 100% drunk to 100% sober in seven years. And it's because they put all the efforts, uh, it, they just had enough. I mean, the kids were drunk, the moms were drunk, the dads were drunk, everybody was beating each other up, and it was terrible. And <clears throat> it's an interesting story, and it's interesting to see the film. Uh, and actually, there was a, a store on the edge of the reservation who the guy that ran it happened to be a recovering alcoholic. And he, and, he, and he talked to one of the elders one day, who was drunk, and said, haven't you had enough of this yet? And they just started turning it around. And so it's a matter of priorities and effort. But there's a lot of good work being done. There's a native, 
I think he's Oneida, something from the East, lives in Denver, uh, who has started a thing called Circles of Recovery. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Yeah. And Circles of Recovery, I think, is going to be par powerful. And it, what it does is it integrates native thinking and native tradition into the 12 steps so that that's far more palatable to natives. Uh, but when you look at these lists, uh, and the reasons, the underlying reasons for all of that is not because natives have brown skin, it's because they have the same sets of problems uh, that manifest in the ghettos and in, in the big cities. Poverty, lack of jobs, on and on and on. And as, as the various nations are beginning to pull themselves out of that, they're doing a pretty good job of addictions. Uh, if I were, if I wanted to destroy uh, natives, I would introduce alcohol on reservations. That's what happened. Yeah, I, I work on a cultural part of our program. That's we good. A lot of our traditional way of yeah. trying to talk to our tender. Keep up the work. Yes, ma'am. Um, I have a 26-year-old son, and he went through a real crisis with uh, drug use and getting into the methamphetamines a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I worked with him with counseling, and, and he ended up in the hospital. He was in really bad shape, but he came back through it. And one of the most crucial things I did with him was the pipe ceremony. And that really helped him get to the point where he realized what his spirituality was. Right and to start turning that around, and he's doing fantastic Great. now. It's been two years he's been in recovery. But he is using uh, tobacco still, and occasionally alcohol. I mean, he has a much less problem, but there are still substances that he's, he's depending on. I'm really yeah. wanting to continue to help him to cut loose of those, but the heavy drug use is, is over for him. That's great. How did you get him in touch with spirituality? Through a, did a sacred pipe ceremony, oh, did you? which I've been taught from Very good. Uh, working with Native American. <clears throat> yes. One of the important things for everybody that's involved with addictions, I think to do is to stay open-minded. Um, and the bottom line is to get people free of drugs and alcohol. It's not to sell this or that or some other program. And uh, within, the, within the limits of ethics, uh, and morality, uh, if it works, I'll try it, okay? Uh, because the sobriety is what counts. Uh, spirituality is a very, very important component of uh, recovery. And spirituality does not mean religion. It's been a great audience. I appreciate it very much. Well, Dr. Lowe, thank you very much.